when we act in courageous ways, that's what builds our self-confidence. That's one of the main key ingredients to building our self-confidence. And as human beings, our brain is wired to avoid pain and to avoid discomfort. Courage is really on some level about being brave enough to endure the discomfort that we may be experiencing mentally or emotionally, literally, physically, somatically in our body. And we have to learn to work with ourselves so that our body and the fight, flight, survival mechanism aspect of us knows that we're not going to die by being courageous, right? We're not going to per perish if we stand up for ourselves. <laughs> This is your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode number 370 with guest Martina Barnes. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, Ask Kickers. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad that you are here. Happy New Year. I know I said that last week, and I feel like I'm going to continue to say it for the rest of January's episode, maybe even into February. I'm just really leaning into this New Year energy. I'm just super pumped. I, mean, I know that maybe some of you are as well, based on uh, what we all faced last year. You know what happened that was sort of funny? I didn't remember that I did this when we took down our Christmas decorations for the 2019 Christmas, I had written a note in this one tub that we have our garland that that goes on our stairs banister. And I wrote a note that said, Happy New Year. Hope you have an awesome, hope you had an awesome 2020. And forgot about it. And then when we went to open up our Christmas decorations last month in December in 2020, I opened it up and was like, ugh. <laughs> Loved my optimism, but it was, oh, my husband and I had a good laugh about it. Anyway, it's a new year and I, I hope you're feeling good. And I wanted to actually talk to... I don't know, maybe about 10 of you listeners that this might be a good fit for. I thought it would be helpful to tell you about a recent client that I had. For those of you who have been contemplating some private coaching with either me or my lead coach, Liz. So I recently worked with a woman who had, she had success in her career. Her resume looked amazing to anyone reading it, but she still really struggled with confidence, more specifically the imposter syndrome. And no one would have ever guessed it based on how ambitious she was and how much she had accomplished. But she just still didn't feel like she had enough experience in her industry, even though she'd been at it for like 20 plus years. So I coached her on where that was coming from so she could easier connect the dots when it came up, gave her tools and exercises to work on, as well as we co-created a strategic plan that worked for her to up-level her career. And I held her lovingly accountable on it. It's still in progress for this year, and she's doing the quote-unquote big effing thing, <laughs> as we called it, that she was too afraid to do before we started working together. And I also work with women who have a feeling, this kind of gut feeling, that they have a problem with their relationship with alcohol. They may not identify as an alcoholic or even a problem drinker, and really about half the clients I take on struggle here. And while working with me is not a recovery program, I am a certified She Recovers coach and have nine years of sobriety and recovery. So I can help you get clarity, again, create a plan and help you activate massive self-awareness around this particular topic that is unique to you. So if you're feeling like, hmm, that's me, or even if you feel like you have this thing that you want to do and you're curious about what a coaching relationship with me or Liz might look like, let's chat. It's super easy to apply. You can just text the word apply to 33. 
777. We will send you the application. It goes to me and my team, and then we will figure out what is the best fit for you to hop on the phone and see what's available to you. Again, text the word apply to 33777. Hey everyone, I wanted to interrupt this intro to just say a few words, hopefully just for a few minutes about the events that happened at the U.S. Capitol on Wednesday. And I am joined by my friend and DEI expert, Jessica Sharp. Hi, Jessica. Hello, hello. I thank you for being here and recording this with me on a weekend. And I just couldn't let the, the podcast episode go out without mentioning it. And I, I want to make, I, I know everyone is feeling so heavy and I I thought a lot about what is my responsibility as a life coach, comma, leader, comma, a podcaster in all of this. And there's there's a few things that I want to say. I feel like it's not my responsibility to, it's not my job to make anyone comfortable. And I'm just talking about personal development. Like as it is, it's not my job to make people comfortable. It is my job to, as I call it, rip the covers off of uncomfortable things, uncomfortable conversations so that we can be better humans. And I cannot ignore what's going on in the United States right now. And I have to say something about it. There's a couple of things that have jumped out at me um, that have really spoken to me and I, I wanted to give voice to. One is in 2017, I was listening to a really fantastic podcast series that I, I've recommended many times on the show. Uh, we will put it in the show notes again. It is from a podcast called Seen on Radio, and that this particular season was called Seeing White. And they were interviewing uh, actor and comedian D.L. Hewley, and he said he was on The View previously, and and he's a he's a black man, and he said. The Obama administration and you know Obama's America is what we as Americans aspire to be. Trump, uh, Trumpism, and Trump supporters are how we really are as a nation. And he had said that on the View. They brought him on this other podcast on Scene on Radio, and and the the host asked him about that, and and he was he was talking about it. And I I one hundred percent agree with that. The other thing is. There is there was a in um, a Facebook Live that Brene Brown did in 2017 after what happened at Charlottesville after the terrorism that happened in, Char- in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I watched it again this morning because it, that was probably one of my favorite. It was is it was an impromptu um, thing that she did. She was answering questions too about shame and about about what was going on, and she talked about how owning our story gives us the opportunity to write our own ending. And this is what I teach people, right? Like about how if we're ashamed of certain things in our lives, if we don't acknowledge those things, they will stay with us and they are poison to our lives. This is why addiction happens. This is why numbing out happens so much. This is the birth of perfectionism and people pleasing. This is largely what How to Stop Feeling Like Shit, my second book, is all about. So so her whole whole thing is, you know, once we own our story, it gives us the opportunity to write a new ending. The the stories that we don't own, own us. She continues to say, the story of white supremacy is the story of America. And until we own that and reckon with that as a nation, we will continue to have these massive problems that that we're seeing that we have today. And a lot of people, you know, even President-elect Joe Biden said, this is not who we are. And as soon as he said that, and I'm seeing a lot of people say that too online. And my thought is like, this is exactly who we are. And we have to start naming it. Like we have to admit that are there great things about America? Of course there are. And our story, what is woven into our DNA is this, is white supremacy, is it all these huge problems and we have not collectively owned it. So I, I really recommend, I'm going to put that link in the show notes too, because she talks about privilege. She talks about power, which is something I talk about in my upcoming book. It, there's just so many things I think that we need to talk about and think about and learn about as a nation and as individual people. So that's my spiel. I know I said a lot. <laughs> What do you think? Yeah, Jeff? Like important things. Yeah. So I, I think that I'm mean, gonna. I think a lot of things, but 
The thing that you said that I wrote down that Brene said is that, you know, when we don't own our stories, our stories own us. And I, you know, I am doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work uh, all the time. Um, I'm a Black woman, so this is also part of my lived experience. And I also live in the South, uh, where race is this thing that uh, we cannot talk about. We pretend like it is; it doesn't exist. Um, and when anyone brings up race and and privilege and supremacy, it is like, oh my gosh, people are clutching their pearls and saying don't talk about it, go sit in a corner, you are being divisive, right, when you have these conversations. And I think that, I mean, I think that's bullshit, certainly, but I also go back to to everything that that you said about what Brene said, and D.L. Hughley said, and Brian Stevenson is one of my heroes, and he says some very similar things. And I think when, you know, for your community and your audience, um, because I, I mean, I've, for those of you who don't know, um, I worked with with Andrea for a while, and um, and you know, am so in this community. I feel like it is our responsibility to not be silent when things matter, and when people push back and say, you know, this is a divisive issue, we shouldn't talk about it, et cetera, et cetera. That means we have to keep pushing harder um, because we will not. It, it is my full, like my just to my core. I believe that we will not get on the other side of of these issues surrounding race, and we won't really get to equity fully if we don't acknowledge a whole lot of things. But if we don't acknowledge, you know, the sins of our country and and the fact that you know black people, I mean, just we've had awful experiences. And and I think that that really sometimes well-intentioned white folks want to not talk about it because it makes them uncomfortable. They don't know what to say. They don't want to fuck it up. They don't want to, you know, uh, they don't want to deal with their own emotions. They don't want to deal with the fact that, you know, a lot of the things that they may have been taught needed to be retaught to them. um, And that may be quite frankly, problematic. Um, But we just, we need to stop being quiet about this stuff. And we've got to have some real difficult, courageous, bold, um, love-based conversations so that we can get to the other side and we can, we can achieve equity in our country and and within smaller pockets within communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your perspective. And yeah, what I saw on Wednesday was a direct result of not talking about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it it was, you know, Charlottesville in 2017. And it's interesting to watch that, that Facebook live that Brene did because she points to so many things by saying like, you know, if we don't, if we don't fix this, if we don't talk about it and own the story (laughs) of America, Mm -hmm. it's not going to get better. And, And what happened on Wednesday is proof of that. And I, I just, yeah, I, I, I want to also kind of back up a little bit and just quickly say that the reason that I come on here and talk about these types of things, you know, some people are like, and I trust me, I've gotten, I think when I sent out the email a month or two ago where I talked about, or no, maybe it was over the summer when, when everything was really tense. And yeah, I, I think was, it was the summer. I was very candid and clear about where I stand with Black Lives Matter and and I had 400 unsubscribes. It was it was the most unsubscribes I've ever had from one email. And it was interesting because I I sat back and thought, wow, it it makes me sad that I'm losing all those people because they're just not going to listen at all. Like there might be people out here who are hearing this who are skipping through it, who are like I don't want to hear it. Um my hope is that you understand that personal development is just not a, it's not just about your own life. If we are not actively, it's my opinion that if we are not actively trying to help and fighting for all women, we fight for no one. And if you vehemently disagree with me, I am probably not the person for you. I'm certainly not the author for you because my next book that's coming out I will talk about this to an extent. I'm not a race educator. That's why I have you here with me right now. (laughs) Um, That's why I consulted with you on that book. But yeah, I certainly am not the person for you. Um, I'm not trying to push my quote unquote agenda on anyone. What I am trying to do is is help people see the parallels between personal Mm -hmm. development and patriarchy and white supremacy and what's going on in the US and in other countries as well. Do you want to add anything to that? 
Uh, the only thing that I will add is like a major ditto. And if you are, you know, if you are someone who is striving to be your very best as a human and, and engaging in personal development activities, it, and you don't feel like um, doing the work of of doing justice work is important, I, I think you need to ask yourself some really hard questions and to ask yourself why why does it why are you even attempting to do work on yourself if you are not trying to be your best self for both yourself but also for other people? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's, it's a lot to think about and a lot to take in. And if nothing else, y'all, if you are, if you're seasoned in this conversation, if you have a high tolerance for it, like I do, or if you're new to it and want to understand more, I highly encourage you to check out those two links that we have in the show notes, the podcast series that I talked about seeing white as well as the Facebook Live that Brene did in 2017. It's about 30 minutes. I'm also going to drop uh, Jessica Sharp's link in there if anyone works for an organization or needs help with diversity, equity, and inclusion, then definitely check out Jessica. And I think that's it. Thank you, everybody, for for bearing with us through this this extra 10 or 15 minutes or so. And I'm going to let you get back to the show. All right. Super excited for you to hear this conversation I had with Martina Barnes. So for those of you that don't know her, let me tell you a little bit about her. Martina speaks and teaches about women's empowerment in a way that has her audience engaged, laughing, and nodding in understanding. She teaches women practical ways to shift how they show up for themselves and express reliable personal power in every area of their lives. Martina Barnes is an experienced psychotherapist, life fulfillment coach, and master intuitive who helps high-achieving women transform the areas in their lives where they lack reliable personal power. She teaches her clients and audiences to say yes when you want to say yes and no when you want to say no, so you can get everything you want out of life. So without further ado, here is Martina. Martina, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I am absolutely delighted to be here, Andrea. Thanks for hosting. Oh, my pleasure. And and I was looking at your site and doing my research before we did this interview, and I thought to myself, well, this woman is right at my alley, and you know the all the people that listen to this show. So let's get right into it because all of these topics that we're about to talk about are things that I know that my audience struggle with, and things that I wrote about in my books. And I love, love, love when other people come on to talk about it because I can say things until I'm blue in the face, but sometimes somebody else says it a little bit differently or uses a different example, and boom, it's a light bulb moment for the listeners. <laughs> Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug-and-play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for for a battle-tested solution. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash noise, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash noise to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash noise. Today's podcast is sponsored by Midi Health. Ladies, are you over 40 like me and dealing with hot flashes, insomnia, brain fog, moodiness, some vaginal dryness, or weight gain? Don't just accept it as part of aging. These symptoms are often linked to hormonal changes during perimenopause and menopause. At Midi Health, they get it. Their experts know what you're going through and how to help. Midi clinicians are menopause specialists offering safe, effective, FDA-approved solutions. And guess what? Midi Care is covered by insurance. So stop pushing through it alone. Schedule a virtual visit and dive deep into your unique symptoms and health background. You'll walk away feeling heard and with a plan to start feeling better. Visit MIDI Health today and reclaim your well-being. You deserve to feel great. Book your virtual visit today at joinmidi.com. That's joinmidi.com. 
joinmidi.com. Joinmidi.com. Let's start with perfectionism, control, and people pleasing, which are are some of the huge ones that, you know, I think probably so many women struggle with. So can you talk about those in terms of what what you call the life bus analogy? Yes, I would love to. So in working with high achieving women, perfectionism, control, people pleasing, as you said, those are very, very common strategic behaviors. And I call them strategic behaviors They're not necessarily conscious, but when we're younger and we're trying to adapt to family and society and trying to find our place, we often develop different aspects of ourselves that have certain qualities that help us. Like if we had a demanding parent, we might become perfectionistic in our actions. I love to think about each of us having a life bus, like a spiritual life bus, and we have lots of different riders in the bus. So we may have the people pleaser part, the control part, the perfectionist, the um, one that that is big on produce, 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 and mm-hmm. Different aspects, depending on our different situations, life situations we're in, will come and jump in the driver's seat. And this happens so seamlessly, we're not even aware necessarily that, oh, I just jumped into my people pleaser, or I just, I just jumped into my time manager and I'm being rigid. Because we're so used to all of the different people on our bus helping to drive the bus. And so we go on autopilot as these parts kind of jump in and out of the driver's seat. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And and I always, the way I talk about it is I say, and I, I got this term from the rooms of 12-step programs is it works until it doesn't. And I, I like that you say that, that you were talking about, we do this many times unconsciously because I, I find that many of my listeners, when they find out they're doing something like one of those default behaviors, they beat themselves up for it and like, oh, and then they feel worse about themselves. And I always say, hey, this got got you to where you are and it was helpful. Maybe people pleasing helped you manage your family of origin or perfectionism helped you get good grades in high school or college. Or I I just always want to like kind of, you know, Hold hold people's hand yeah. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Works until it doesn't. Absolutely, I love that. It's so easy, especially I think as women, we expect so much of ourselves, and we can default into shame when we become aware of a behavior that maybe is no longer serving us. So I love that you encourage them to see this as something that got them as far as it did, and and. Now it's not maybe working anymore. So I love to think about who do we want, who we want to be our bus driver. For me, I want my highest, best, most authentic, courageous self to be in the driver's seat, uh, the drive, right? And Mm -hmm. what's so interesting is, as I said, there's so much autopilot going on that you know, parts are sitting in different seats on the bus and they see a situation and they rush to the front and they, they hijack the bus and then they take us down a road we don't necessarily want to go down. So for example, if somebody goes into a rage because they've been habitually suppressing their anger and they can't suppress it any longer the rage part might go to the driver's seat and take over and then take us down this rough, rocky road with potholes in it and it's dangerous and it, it, it can cause a lot of damage to the bus. But once the rage part did its thing, then it's gone. It's maybe sitting at the back of the bus and we look around and we see, uh-oh, that part of me did some damage. How am I going to cope mm-hmm. with that? Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And, and yeah. Oh, 
Lord knows I've been on damage control before <laughs> many times. And he, here's one thing I, if I could add something that I, I talk about fairly often over here, my listeners have probably heard me talk about this before, is that it's not about eradicating the, the goal is not to eradicate completely perfectionism and people pleasing and control and overachieving. It's about recognizing when it jumps in the driver's seat of the bus, as you as you so so plainly put it. And and for me, I I think about my listeners actually when I when I do this in my own life. So just last week, I was very triggered by someone in my life that I'm kind of dancing this boundary dance with, and I immediately started to type out a text that I would have very much regretted if I said yes. It. And so I was so, honestly, I was proud of myself that I, I didn't do it and also was comp- self-compassionate enough to understand that that's okay if that's my knee-jerk reaction because I'm a human. This other person hurt my feelings. I was completely triggered because this person knows me well enough to probably do it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm like, okay. And, and, I, and I just want to underscore that that is really enormous growth for people even if even if I had done it, even if I had sent it and quickly tried to clean it up as best I could, that's still growth too. So the, the speed at which you can either do your damage control or stop yourself before you send the text or try to micromanage someone or, you know, whatever, whatever the behavior is, I, I always like to acknowledge that in my clients, like, hey, this is a big difference from where you were before. Exactly. And you stated all of that so beautifully. We, we really aren't aiming to eradicate any of these parts that have been helpers for us. And as you said, had that part, you know, taken over your driver's seat and sent that text that would have been okay too, because that also would have been growth. And if we think about everybody on the bus as parts of like our inner family, we, we're not going to kill off somebody. uh, Hopefully Mm -hmm. Um, we, we, we we're not going to throw them out the window of the bus, but we want to help these different aspects, maybe update their job resumes. Because I found that in letting go of perfectionism, I still really enjoy striving for excellence. Yeah. And there's a difference. And um, yes, what, you know, perfectionism is outward focused, you know, what are people going to think and striving for excellence is inward focused. Very well so stated. It have to do with me and my values. Yeah. Well, I want to, you might've already answered this, but I want to make sure that, that we cover it. What blocks a high achieving women from having what you call reliable personal power? Probably the top thing I would say is fear. And fear of being perceived as a bitch, scared of loss, I might lose that person, I might fall in disfavor, I might not, I might not be perceived as likable anymore. There are some other things I'll share in just a minute. I was thinking about what happened to me the other day, I was purchasing a new car, I had saved my money, I had cash to pay for this car. And I I went to several dealers. I drove the car. It's a Toyota hybrid. And I was texting back and forth with a salesperson in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. And and he he was negotiating with me in a way that I felt like he kept trying to pull the wool over my eyes. And Mm -hmm. maybe he wasn't used to a woman negotiating as hard as I did. It was, it was very, very polite, but I kept challenging him. I said, for example, a 10% discount on the sticker price for a 2020 and it's mid November and you're trying to move those cars off the lot. That isn't a great discount. And I quoted the discount that he had sent me an email uh, with, and he said, where did you get that? Where did you get that number? Where did you see that advertised? I said, you emailed it to me. 
So, <laughs> and I could tell that I could feel that he was getting more and more frustrated with me. And I was just trying to advocate for myself. And I was doing it in a strong way. I was doing it with confidence. I was doing it with politeness. And I wasn't concerned if he perceived me as a bitch. Now, maybe even five years ago, before I made some major shifts, I would have been concerned about that. And I mm-hmm. would have been concerned that I didn't give the sale, sale to him, but I ended up giving it to a dealer closer to me because I felt that they were, they just were a lot more respectful. And, okay. and so that, that idea as women, if we, and I know you've probably talked about this a hundred times, that if we advocate for ourselves, if we stand up for ourselves, we're considered a bitch. But if a man mm-hmm. does that, then he's, he's congratulated. He's patted on the back. Wow. You really yeah, it's just normal right? behavior for that. Total normal behavior. And so, so we, we get scared and then we need to, in the next step, I think with recognizing our fear is draw upon our courage. I think that's something that you talk a lot about. Is that right? I do talk about courage here a lot. I'm, I'm certified in Brene Brown's work in, in the daring way and her, her research on shame and courage. And, and yes, I just want to, I want to just add one quick thing to your example about when we're in that point of not wanting to be perceived a certain way. And in your case, you're negotiating with this, this man and you don't want to be, you know, the former you, I should say, it sounded like didn't want to be perceived, might not want to be perceived as a bitch. And because we can go into a shame spiral if we feel that we're being perceived that way. And sometimes we know for sure that we were being perceived that way because someone calls us a yes. name or pushes back. So it's not just imagined. <laughs> they, they actually do perceive us that way. And then that sends us into a shame spiral. So you were just about to talk about courage, which is one of my favorite subjects. Oh, yes. It's the shame spiral. Oh my goodness. I love that you're certified in Brené Brown's work because when her first work, when her work first came out, I got so excited. I feel like I became her shame ambassador. This is before <laughs> there were any groupies. I called myself a groupie of hers. <laughs> I am certainly a groupie. And so I believe that courage, when we act in courageous ways, that's what builds our self-confidence. That's one of the main key ingredients to building our self-confidence. And as human beings, our brain is wired to avoid pain and to avoid discomfort. So courage is really on some level about being brave enough to endure the discomfort that we may be experiencing mentally or emotionally, literally physically, somatically Mm -hmm. in our body. And we have to learn to work with ourselves so that our body and the fight flight survival mechanism aspect of us knows that we're not going to die by being courageous, right? We're not going to perish if we stand up for ourselves. Yes, which it certainly feels like we're going to when we're in the moment. It does. It's so scary, (laughs) right? It's so scary. Like our heart starts beating and maybe we get tight in our stomach. We might start to perspire. Calm sweating. Yes. Mm -hmm. and My armpits start to tingle. I know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and it's, to me, it's a little bit like playing that game of chicken. Do you remember that game of chicken with the, chicken? yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and, and so it's a little bit like one part of us that's really scared is driving the car. And then there's another part, you know, driving, driving the other car. And if we can hold on to the steering wheel and know that we're not going to crash into the wall, we're not going to, we're not going to go careening over the cliff like Thelma and Louise, we're going to be fine. Just hold on. And the more practice we have at this, the easier it gets. Is that what you have found? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I I have 100% found that. I've been doing a lot of research lately on confidence and, and looking, I should say, looking at research that's been done 
in various countries and and it's it's extremely interesting <laughs> <laughs> the differences between male and female confidence and the the most recent research that i've seen says that men also have their doubts the difference is that men are more likely to take action than women are yeah and and that didn't surprise me to 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 read that research and yeah it's it's it, there's so many things involved and i don't i don't want to intimidate people it, there's so many important things involved, I should say. And one of those things is, is what you were pointing to, Martina, is about our self-talk. Yes. And really, and again, I'll, I'll point to the example I just gave about last week when I was dealing with something really difficult and I was telling my husband, I don't want, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Like I wanted to just ignore it. I wanted to just pretend like it wasn't happening. And he's like, well, that's an option. And I mean, he wasn't encouraging <laughs> that and he knows that I won't do that. But I think it's helpful to make that distinction sometimes. And be, and again, because it's about acknowledging your courage that, you know, I am going to respond in a healthy manner. I'm not going to ignore this, even though I might've ignored it 15 years ago. And that's not, that's not in alignment with my values. But it's, it's really exactly what you said, that knowledge of knowing implicitly that I will not die and that this too shall pass, yeah. this massive discomfort that I'm feeling. I read somewhere that most difficult conversations are three to 15 minutes long. That's not too bad. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say three to 15 hours. We're not hostage negotiators. <laughs> right? oh, it feels like that sometimes. I know. Oh, doctor. Yeah. And I, and I say that because the discomfort I have found, I don't know if you have Martina, but the discomfort stays the same yeah. just because I have the tools and I have the awareness. I'm still massively uncomfortable when I have to have hard conversations, when I have to do various things. The difference is that I am more confident that it will be okay on the other end. Yeah. And that's what creates more confidence. Yes. And, you know, someone came to me recently who, who had traveled with her best friend and maybe they've been best friends for a couple of years and, and her friend had withheld the things that was annoying to her about my client. And then at the end of the week, just unleashed a kind of rage on her. Oh dear. And, and of course she was very taken aback and she felt very traumatized about that. And she also saw it as a gift because she realized that that is not healthy behavior, even though her friend mm -hmm. said, oh, we're just having a friend fight. No, the way she was fighting was super unhealthy. And, exactly. and the client was courageous enough to say that. And she was courageous enough to walk away from the friendship because mm -hmm. she had had types of folks in her life like that before. She didn't know that that particular friend had that in her. And her friend her friend couldn't hear where she was coming from. And so if that other person can't hear where we're coming from, and especially if we tried repeated times, then sometimes we have to make a tough choice to let go of a person who just demonstrates toxic behavior. Now that's an extreme mm -hmm. example. And hopefully most of the time we don't have to walk away from friendships like that, but we do need to have the courage, as you've talked about, to really live out our values and know that we're going to come out okay on the other side. And I feel confident that this client isn't going to unconsciously attract someone like this again. Or if she does, she's going to nip it in the bud really quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I have come to find after years of doing this work is about figuring out a way to, and I know I, I want to acknowledge how challenging this can be in our female friendships because a lot of my listeners, I would probably say most of my listeners are really into personal development. Like this isn't the only personal development podcast that right. they listen to. They immerse themselves in the work and uh, many times they have dear friends who are not interested in doing this. Yeah. So 
coming to agreements about boundaries in the friendship yes. can be complicated when other people don't want to hear it. Yes. I always tell people, you know, it's not everyone's destiny to be this evolved human who's willing to look at their shortcomings and shadow sides. And I just want to acknowledge how, how difficult that is for people. But all that being said, and I'm sure this is something you worked out with your client, is that it's not about just running away no. from the friend. And it depends on how invested you are in the friendship, yeah. but it, it sounds like it was worth telling that person like, hey, I hear everything you're saying about me and all these this list of grievances that you have. And there's also a way to tell me that with my friend, my dear friend Amy Smith says with grace and kindness. And, and that's a learned skill that not everyone has and takes a lot of... Um, it just takes some time to to be graceful and kind in your delivery. Exactly. It takes time, it takes practice and and I'm not suggesting that we walk away from relationships that are important to us by any means. Sometimes in a friendship if the other person isn't really there to do they're not available for that personal growth, we might just we might just move them around a little bit in our life. We may not share as deeply with that person. We may continue to love them, keep them in our life. But that's one thing that Brene Brown talks about is we like we have to choose the people that we share our heart with, that they are worthy, you know, and able and capable of hearing our pain. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. Yes. Yes. A thousand percent. Yes. And you know, I've had a handful of clients who have brought situations to our coaching relationship where they've needed to tell a friend something that wasn't okay with them. So they take the time to work on it. They have all of their notes. And it's it's important because, yes. again, delivery matters, tone matters, yes. <laughs> environment matters. And and I always say, you know, give that person the opportunity to clean it exactly. up. Exactly. You may be surprised. Like, they may receive it really well. That's right. And I would say probably 60 to 70% of the time, the recipient does receive it well. Like, are they ecstatic to hear that they've hurt their friend? <laughs> no, but I, it just, it matters so much in, in the relationship. And that is also one on vulnerability and intimacy and creating a better bond than you even had before. Exactly. And I think that that's, what you're speaking to about that better bond is key because when we're courageous, I find that that we we're rewarded for that. Maybe not in a way that we can recognize right away, but when it comes to friendships and relationships, when we are honest with the other person and give them the opportunity to clean it up, then we're actually opening ourselves to deeper intimacy with that person. And that's the reward. If we hold it in, we start distancing ourselves. We start disconnecting from that person that we love and that we care about. So yes, courage will will bring so many beautiful, beautiful rewards to us. I have definitely been in that place where my paycheck ran out before the next one got here. Life doesn't happen bi-weekly, so why should payday? The money you earn can be in your hands today with Earnin. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work, up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. Just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then access up to $100 a day as you work and leave an optional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. You can use Earnin to pay for a girl's night out, a last minute gift for a loved one, or even summer camp for the kids. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security. It gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E A R. N-I-N in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in noise under podcast when you sign up. It really, really helps the show. Noise under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC.
Fast forward to the end of 2024 and think about your goals. What can you do right now to give yourself the best chance of succeeding? If you want to learn a new language, you absolutely should get Babbel. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Now it's so easy to speak simple conversation phrases with the guy that takes care of my lawn without having to consult language apps. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash noise. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash noise, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash noise. Rules and restrictions may apply. <laughs> I want to shift gears slightly and ask you about intuition. And I know that you've been a clinician, a therapist for for many, many years now. And intuition is one of those things that gets talked about a lot in these circles. And one of the things that I've been especially interested lately in, and it's, you know, goes along with just being a trauma informed facilitator. And that is what role have you seen over the years it does does trauma play in women listening to their intuition? So more specifically, what I what I see is women have a hard time listening to their intuition because of past trauma that they've had. What do you think about that? You're you are spot on. When when we are young, if we are in a traumatic family environment, our intuition might tell us to put certain bus drivers in the seat, like the people pleaser, or let's be very quiet. Let's not rock the boat. We don't want to wake up mom who's snoring from passing out, you know, with alcohol. And, and as we get older, what happens is we lose connection with our intuition because we're feeling something. We might feel something or perceive something in the relational field as a child or a young adult. And yet maybe the family members are telling us that what we're feeling or what we're perceiving is not true. So that's one aspect where we start to question ourselves. And then trauma impacts our physical body, our emotional self, our mental self. And all of our wires start to get crossed. So especially with complex childhood trauma, the the mechanism of the fight, flight, the nervous system, our brain is developing, all of those mechanisms just cross our wires. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking also of, you know, someone maybe who, is in their early 20s and they're madly in love with a man and they have this intuitive sense that he's cheating on them. And and every time she confronts her boyfriend, he denies it and he starts to say things like, you're crazy, you're jealous, you're just trying to control me. And so then that is very traumatic to experience being lied to in that way. And then eventually the truth always comes out mm-hmm. and, oh my goodness, he has been like, he's had a second girlfriend the whole year that I've been dating him. And so that hits our self-esteem and we then may shame ourselves because I knew that I was right. I knew he was cheating on me and I didn't walk away because I loved him and I wanted to believe he loved me and I was so invested. I was so invested in this relationship working out. So then when we have that distrust, whether it's from childhood trauma or a traumatic experience that happens to us as a a young adult or an adult, then we don't know what to believe anymore. And we get in the habit of overriding the impulses that are what we call intuition or unconscious intelligence. 
So, so trauma just crosses so many wires inside. And when we can work with a trustworthy coach like yourself, I'm sure you're able to help uh, the client start to unwind all of those old messages and false beliefs they believed they took on about themselves. And, and then they can start to get in clear communication with themselves again. Yes. I'm, I'm so glad that you shared all of that because, uh, well, and, and for the record, I am not trained in complex trauma and those people get referred out, lovingly referred out to someone like you or someone who's, who's trained to do that. Um, also, my, my friend that I mentioned, Amy Smith, was on the podcast um, not long before this one talking about hypnotherapy. And there's, there's all these different modalities for people to be able to, to heal from that. And, and I will say that it's not a one and done thing for many people. It's, um, like you said, it's complex and it has layers. And I was sort of grimacing over here. I know no one can see me, but as you were telling that story, that example, I'm like, that was my life. That was, that was, that exactly happened to me. And I was gaslit just as you. Yes. And then, and then my thoughts sounded like, am I crazy? Like, am I? And then also my ex-husband was, was literally telling people that I was crazy, telling everybody in his family, telling all of our friends that I was crazy. He called, he called me a nut job. He called me all these names. And so that he could continue this other relationship. And then it all ended up falling apart for, for him and for us. And, and after that, I, I told myself, you know, never again am I going to not trust my intuition. And then guess what I ended up doing? Oh, not no. trusting my intuition. <laughs> so, so then it was the second relationship where I pulled my head up and thought, okay, this is bigger than me and I need real help to be able to heal from it. And that's really when I went on the trajectory to change my life. And I say all of that because I just want to underscore that it is complex and no two individuals will likely have the same experience. I mean, you won't have the same circumstances and the same healing experience. So I encourage people as much as they can to try different things. Right now I'm working with a therapist and we're doing somatic energy healing. I love that. And, um, yeah, it's taken me a long time to trust her. Yes. And I mean, obviously I have trust issues clearly. <laughs> Understandably so. And she's been phenomenal, and and I'm I'm really happy to be. I mean, you know, you're a self help junkie when you're excited about. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> right, walking into this. But anyway, that was a long winded response of saying thank you for, uh, and and I am I'm committed this year especially started to become more trauma informed and talk about things like that because I think we are doing a disservice yeah. to people in this industry by just saying things like just trust your intuition which I've yeah. said before like even in my first book <laughs> and I'm like oh except when you know and, and it just it can be complicated very complicated and you said something really key here that you said to yourself after your first marriage, never again, I'm going to trust my intuition no matter what. And, and that's a beautiful intention. And yet it was a great sentiment, right? right? <laughs> great sentiment. And as human beings, I, I'm not evolved enough to get the lesson the first time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I hear you, sister, I had more than one relationship like that in my twenties. And and, and it devolved to the point that I stopped eating, I couldn't sleep, I started getting right. migraine headaches, you mm. know, so, and our body is telling us like, put the brakes on, mm -hmm. you know, so it is very complex. It's not as easy as saying, trust your intuition, because there are lots of voices in us. There are lots of riders on the bus, the life bus. Well, which one do we know is the true voice? And it takes practice. And again, it takes, it takes courage and, and it's very multi-layered and it's an ongoing process. I was born with a highly intuitive brain and I was given so many mixed messages that by the time I was probably 20, I thought I was crazy. And, 
And it took me some time to really extricate myself from my family of origin beliefs. I came from an alcoholic family. And so that road to learning to trust my intuition again, it was a long road. And I had to be patient with myself and not fall into the being um, a victim of the gaslighting and, and just know that every time I took a baby little step, that was, that was developing my trust in my intuition. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've read this particular book, but it could be a helpful book for your audience. It's called the gaslight effect. I haven't, I haven't read that one. We can, we can put that in the, in the show notes. I think it's Robin Stern who wrote it and gaslighters, they show up in different ways. Some appear as such good guys, like I'm such a good guy or I'm such a good gal. And, and they're very sophisticated in their gaslighting. And she really names the different types of gaslighters. And she also names being a gaslightee why do we buy into that? What is it inside ourselves that we want to believe or we're trying to work out? I found it a super helpful book. That is really interesting. Yes. I encourage people to, to learn more about that. But one, one other thing I want to tag on to this, conver- this part of the conversation is I learned something from one of my guests a few months ago. We had um, Britt Frank on. She's a licensed therapist as well, and she specializes in in people healing from narcissistic relationships. Oh, and yes. she, she talked to us about something called reactive abuse. Yes. Opened my eyes so much because I had some shame from abusing my ex husband back when he would gaslight me. And I learned fairly quickly in order to have some semblance of power in the relationship how to push his buttons and just shovel the shit right back at him. Of course. And I felt terrible for it. And it doesn't feel good to no. do when you're doing it. And even the aftermath, it's been a decade and a half. And so her, I immediately Googled it right after we, we got off the phone and I was yes. like, oh my gosh, this is a, this is a normal, typical thing that happens That's in right. relationships. And, and if, if anyone missed that show, go back and listen to it. I got a lot of really great feedback on it and or reactive abuse, Google it. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing that. It's so important because it's a survival mechanism. Yes. And uh, that's one response. Another response might be to tend and befriend your abuser. And if you, um, if you hadn't fought back, who knows what would have happened. Fighting back may have eventually helped you leave the relationship. So Mm -hmm. there's no shame. It's a completely natural reaction. Especially if you have a feisty personality, which I know a lot of my listeners (laughs) don't just sit back and don't say anything. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it was nice to know that it was a not like a normal part of those types of relationships. Yeah. Well, Martina, I have loved this conversation so much. Everyone go to martinabarnes.com and and is there anything specific, any specific location on the interwebs that you want to send people to where they can learn more about you? I would love folks to check out reliablepersonalpower.com. It's just one page where you can sign up to take a quiz and see where you rate with your reliable personal power. It has a link to my main website as well. It's a fun quiz. It's maybe 10 questions. Fantastic. We, we love our quizzes, don't we? We do love our <laughs> quizzes because we have inquisitive minds and we want to yes. know, hey, where, especially those of us who are personal self-growth junkies, we want to know where we rate on certain things and where we want to beef up our skills. I, yes, I've had many guests come on and talk about different personality tests, and I, I love them too. Okay, reliablepersonalpower.com. Yes. We'll put that link in the show notes as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And everyone, you know how much I value your time. Thank you again for, for joining me and my guests. And remember, it's our life's journey to make ourselves better humans and our life's responsibility to make the world a better place. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to your Kick-Ass Life podcast. If you'd like some extra support, we would love to see how we can help you. You can apply for private coaching by simply texting the word apply to 33777 and the link will be sent to you.
I'd like to introduce you to the Minimalist Moms podcast. It's hard enough being a mom, and the last thing you need is stress from too much stuff and an overcrowded schedule. For too long, I lived with the mindset that bigger was better, and the more I added to my life, instead of feeling better, I felt overwhelmed. It was time for a radical new mindset. Less is more. I'm not into extremes. I didn't throw everything away. My brand of minimalism is more about adding than subtracting. Get rid of the excess to make room for what you love. In other words, it's about living life with purpose. I hope you'll listen in and my guest and myself can inspire you to think more and do with less. The Minimalist Moms Podcast, available wherever you listen to podcasts.